there we go. So I got a last minute note that uh, this was not the 98th annual. This was the ninth annual State of the Union, State of the Nation address for small business IT. So welcome everybody. This is Carl Polichuk of Small Biz Thoughts. And <clears throat> just at the very, very end of a cough that I've had for six weeks, please let me just start by telling everybody, stay home if you don't feel well. Don't go to conferences and cough all over people. There, having said that, welcome to the ninth annual State of the Nation Address for SMB. <clears throat> couple of notes, just uh, housekeeping, I guess. First of all, uh, make sure that your speakers are working and uh, that you've got everything tuned up the way it should be. Uh, we're going to be using the questions panel, not the chat. So, uh, I, I, you know, I've only got so many eyes. So, uh, later on, we'll take some questions. Uh, if you want to invite people to come in or make comments about anything I say, pro or con, uh, just use the hashtag Carl P. I appreciate that. If you want to email me, uh, it's Carl P at smallbizthoughts.com or you can find me on Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, all that other happy stuff. For those of you who are new to Small Biz Thoughts and to following the stuff that I do, I am a blogger and a podcaster and I do all kinds of things. I recently released uh, two revised books. So I'm, I'm the author of 17 books, mostly focused on managed services and building a, a good IT infrastructure and building a successful IT focused uh, service business. <clears throat> I have owned, I've built and, and sold two successful managed service businesses in Sacramento, California. I also own a book publishing company, and that's my primary focus these days is on the publishing and the training. So here's some ways you can get a hold of me. <clears throat> if you're not connected with me at, on Twitter and Facebook and so forth, you should do that. But these are some websites that I run. Uh, one of them that I think some of you have not looked at but maybe of interest is the consultant or amateur the consultant or amateur blog is a very light blog, meaning I don't post a lot. But basically, the argument there is that this is a place where I put up articles that you can send your clients to. So, for example, you're trying to sell them a backup. You go look there and you say, look, this guy's telling you the exact same thing I'm telling you, you know, and just basically use it to support your arguments of why they should have strong passwords and hire a professional and all that kind of stuff. So that's just a, a blog that a lot of people haven't quite discovered yet, but it's out there. <clears throat> so today we're going to have some announcements. We're going to talk about some new things that are going on. I want to do a little recap, as I always do, of my thoughts and impressions of 2017 and then look forward to what I think might be the, the focus of attention within our community in 2018. Uh, and then at the end, I want to do kind of a presentation on expanding and growing your business and the role of consistency and, and scalability as you grow your business. So <clears throat> let's start with 2017. So Last year, I was happy to make 128 presentations in 42 different cities on three continents. I managed to get um, more trips than that. To some cities like Chicago, I ended up going to several times. I had two major book revisions, uh, one new audio book, Managed Services in a Month. My a uh, publishing company produces Great Little Seminar, which is our teaching arm. We produced 11 courses in 2017. Those were taught by myself, my brother Manuel, Josh Peterson, and Rayanne Buccianico. So we're going to expand that in 2018. 
I also wrote 125 blog posts, put up 115 new videos and dozens of webinars and podcasts and so forth and so on with other people and managed to produce about 64 newsletters. 52 of those are my weekly newsletter for SMBIT. And uh, I appreciate everyone who follows that. We are just, just right on the verge of having 10,000 weekly subscribers for that. And of course, I did one monster road show, which is where a lot of these presentations came in. So some announcements here. I'm going to, in this year, 2018, I'm gonna do four events for Channel Pro. So if you have not looked at what Channel Pro puts together, go to Channel Pro Network and check it out. These events are free to you and include good food and great information. And I'm also gonna do four of the SMB Tech Fests. These are always in Anaheim. Again, it's sort of the, the battle of uh, food, <laughs> for food versus knowledge. Uh, always good information, always good food. Within my company's great little seminar, we're doing 15 courses this year, uh, including some new courses. There's going to be a new course on service agreements, applying the book, and there's gonna be a new course on cloud services later in the year. Several of these classes, the ones that I teach, are repeated at four o'clock Pacific. And that is specifically intended so that my good friends in Australia and New Zealand and all, in, all over the Pacific Rim can join me at, I think it's 11 o'clock in the morning in Sydney. So uh, 11 o'clock Wednesday or 4 p.m. Tuesday, we are repeating these and I repeat them live. So I did the first one a couple days ago. And so the, <clears throat> the second class of that five-week class uh, will be next week, will also be repeated as well. And so you should also stay connected to my newsletter. And I've got a, a big calendar of events at the end of that, which gets updated all the time. And if you are attending any in-person live events that you think that the rest of the people in the community should know about, send me an email and I will be happy to uh, add those to that as well. I am just posting up the information now, so I'm gonna be spending the next week or so revising the website, but I have announced or will announce this week the dates for the 2018 SMB Roadshow. So this was very, very different from last year. It will not be the same content. Last year was on building cloud service bundles. This year, it's on cloud services and managed services and why that's a killer combo. This will be an afternoon seminar. This will not be an all day seminar. And so obviously the price is gonna be significantly lower than last year as well. So we're gonna start out in Phoenix, Arizona and then do Charleston, New Orleans. I'm going to both Honolulu and Maui in April and then uh, Denver in May. So <clears throat> I am open to suggestions for doing more roadshow dates, but right now uh, those are the cities that we have are, are officially announcing this week. And I also would like to announce that I am uh, pairing up with my good friend, Josh Peterson from Bering McKinley. And Josh, are you on the line here? He was going to see if he could jump in. Uh, so this is a new tool to me, so I'm not sure where the other panelists show up. <laughs> Panelists. Okay, so uh, so Josh is not here yet, but he will be here. I think he'll be here. The um, <clears throat> so what we're announcing today and uh, scheduled at nine o'clock, so just a few minutes ago, on at the SMB Community Podcast blog and also at the Small Biz Thoughts blog, is the official announcement of managed services in a month peer teams. So basically, these are peer groups run by Bering McKinley. And Bering McKinley, they've been doing this for more than five years and Josh has been doing this for um, more than 10 years. 
I think 14 is, is the actual number. And the peer teams are intended to be something where people get together and share their experiences. And the managed services in a month peer teams are specific, specifically focused on um, the concepts that start with the new book, Managed Services in a Month, the third edition, which is really, uh, a friend of mine described it as the ultimate guide to managed services. And so uh, what happens is that Josh and his team run people through exercises to get the most out of that, to make sure everybody is held accountable for the goals that they set, setting reasonable goals and so forth. But basically it's focused around, um, begins with the concepts of this book. And so the first thing that happens is everybody goes through the book together and talks about where they are with regard to implementing these things. Generally the peer teams I think have eight to 12 members and um, meet twice a year in person and eight times or 10 times a year over the phone or, or with a you know, video call. So it's a great opportunity to engage with other people. I think the price is very reasonable. And on both the blogs that I mentioned, Small Biz Thoughts and SMB Community Podcast, I have a link to register for another webinar next Wednesday, the 17th at 11 o'clock Pacific. Josh and I are going to talk about the specifics of this and we're going to answer all of your questions about what's involved and um, you know, what you can expect to get out of these peer teams. I will mention that even if you have a coach of some kind, joining a peer team can actually help you get more out of what you are hearing from your coach and help you be held accountable in a different kind of way. So it's not like they're mutually exclusive. There's also the, the case that many coaches, including myself, are ridiculously expensive. And so it may be more valuable to people to be involved in a peer team rather than coaching. So anyway, that's that. I certainly will take any questions people have on Wednesday the 17th with regard to the managed services in a month peer teams. So <clears throat> let's look at the year behind. So in 2017, we saw a lot of interesting stuff. The IOT, Internet of Things, has expanded dramatically. It's a very interesting statistic I heard that there are now more IOT devices than there are human beings on Earth. And the thing about IOT is that it is, it is going to be the poster child for the kind of growth and expansion that we're going to see probably for the rest of our lives, but certainly for the next 10 years. Think about replacing all of your light bulbs with, you know, connected devices. And then think about all of the light bulbs in an office building, in one office building. There might be millions in one building. Now think about all of the light bulbs on earth eventually moving to this. Now, obviously the prices have to come down. I have one light bulb that is super amazing color changing and you could program it to automatically do stuff even when you're not home and um, change it to any color so you can have blue mood lighting when you're watching TV or whatever that light bulb was $40. Now, obviously that price is gonna come down. Most of the light bulbs in my front office are in the range of 15 to $20. Again, very expensive. On the other hand, they realistically are supposed to last like 30 or 40 years. So my point is the explosion of these devices is going to be massive and it is going to be worldwide. The interesting thing is that the generation that exists now will simply become completely obsolete in a few years. All of those light bulbs are going to move into uh, doing far more than simply providing light. You can have Li-Fi, which is, which is Wi-Fi delivered over light. You'll be able to have lights using information to 
pass data back and forth between automobiles on the road, right? So it's, it's literally the beginning, the, the tip of the iceberg with regard to the emerging technologies that we are all going to be seeing. And if you're in this business, if you're listening to this uh, webinar, you're the target. You literally are the person who's going to have the opportunity to make money on all of these things. And there's so many other technologies that are emerging into being TCP IP based. For those of you who attended my roadshow, you heard people in the audience talk about some of the things they're doing, or you heard stories of me relaying things that people had talked about of getting into replacing thousands and thousands and thousands of security keypads because now that they're TCP IP, we can replace them, we can understand the technology, we can fix them, we can troubleshoot them, right? That's just all opportunity for us. On the bad side, annoying technology, well, we've got all of you know the continuing ransomware and crypto viruses, but I have to say <clears throat> more and more the case is that it, it's clear to me, if you patch systems, there's absolutely no excuse for people to get these viruses. 100% of the ransomware that I'm aware of in 2017 came through unpatched holes in people's systems. And this is just going to get worse and worse and worse. Literally last week, the, the Spectre and Meltdown viruses or, or security holes were announced and Microsoft and Apple have both released patches. So at this point, if somebody were to develop a way to crack in and get information using that hole, they would only be attacking the unpatched systems. This is the greatest argument for managed services that we've ever experienced. And you should be selling with that in mind. Related to some of these changes that are coming along are the, the blockchain technologies and Bitcoin. And I know people, a lot of people actually, in the real estate industry. And I gotta say, man, it's like pulling teeth to get those people to move into the 20th century, let alone the 21st century. And yet, there are people saying that legal transactions, including buying and selling property, will take place with blockchain legal documents. Uh, blockchain is also the, the technology behind the e-monetary system, such as Bitcoin. And my favorite joke about Bitcoin, when you think about Bitcoin mentality, when you, when you listen in on a conversation at a, a Bitcoin household, you get a sense of how fast this, uh, the, the value of Bitcoin is increasing. The kid looks at the paper and he says, dad, what is 8,492? And the dad says, 12,971, what do you need with 18,442? Point is, it's gr growing so exponentially that we can't keep track of it. Um, and, and who knows where that's gonna go or, or if it's a bubble or whatever, but it is certainly something. It's not nothing that's there. There's something there. And I know people who have bought and sold things using Bitcoin. Most people I think that, that I'm aware of uh, use it as an investment tool. And now you can buy indexes, in, which means you can go to E-Trade and buy um, E-Coin uh, indexes. So that's an interesting thing. And we shall see how that goes with the rest of the economy. But again, you're at the forefront. You have a better chance of even just understanding this stuff than most of your clients. So, you know, unfortunately, the, the bad news for everybody on this call is you have to dedicate to educate yourself. You have to continue to work on staying on the cutting edge because that's where the money's going to be. Uh, past due managed services. All I simply mean by that is that if you have not yet got onto the managed services train, um, it is time to do it. Uh, you, you can always get on the, on the bus, right? There's, it's never too late, but man, uh, I, I just firmly believe that break fix is a thing of the past and that the world is now too complicated to wait until things break. And um, it's, it's irresponsible 
to let clients' systems break so that you can make money. Figure out how you can make money keeping those systems from breaking. That's my philosophy. So <clears throat> in the last year, so we started 2017, the Dow was at almost just, just under 20,000. And we finished at 24 and a half, 24.7 thousand. Um, as somebody who has invested in the stock market since the early 90s, I have seen markets go up and I've seen them come down. And I was quite concerned that it was overheated a year ago. <laughs> and uh, it's gone up 20% uh, since then. So who knows what's gonna happen with the market? You know, I certainly don't have a crystal ball, but you should have a strategy. And, you know, certainly it's always better in the long term to be in the market than to be out. But if you wait for it to go down to a 20% correction and then put your money in, uh, you may be waiting another year. So, you know, there, there will be a correction. There will always be a correction. Like there's a 100% probability that you'll have a 10 to 20% correction at some point, but no one knows whether that's going to be in an hour, a day, a week, a month, or a year. So, you know, have a strategy. You know, if you're, if you're not sophisticated with investments, then find an investment advisor. And I personally recommend that you find somebody who charges a flat fee and doesn't take a percentage of your trades and doesn't make money every time you buy and sell because they're just gonna encourage you to do a bunch of buying and selling. So um, anyway, educate yourself and get involved because if, if you don't do that, you are literally just letting some of your money go uh, without doing its job, which your, your money's job should be to work for you. Also, our industry is changing. As I've gone around the world, I have met more young people in the last 12 months at the meetings and at the conferences and at the events than I have seen in, in at least the five years before that. We also were in a market where mergers and acquisitions are very, very strong. Many people are growing their managed service businesses by buying other managed service businesses, <clears throat> buying other small IT businesses, even those who are not managed services. Now, the good news is you should never just walk away from your business uh, if you think that you want to retire or go get a real job or whatever. Um, there's some money there, so don't walk away from it. The bad news is it's probably not worth as much as you think it is. <laughs> so um, if you go to sellmymsp.com, you can get involved with uh, Amy and Rayanne and, and see, uh, get some idea of what your business might be worth. But it is not zero. It's probably also not a million dollars. So uh, anyway, um, if, you, if you want some realistic idea about what, what you should be doing, whether you should be doing the buying or the selling, that's one place to get started. <clears throat> I also see that more and more people are actually getting into new technologies. At the Next Gen Conference in December, I sat in on seminars about Internet of Things and about how we monitor uh, the growing number of technologies that are out there. So, um, again, you need to start educating yourself on this. It's not something that you can ignore. Um, if you don't keep up on it, you will be behind the times. Uh, again, you're going to see more and more of blockchain. So if you don't, if you don't, if you don't know that term, or you don't know much about it, uh, I encourage you to go get a book or read a blog or whatever. But begin thinking about that and where it can affect your business. I also think that we're moving into an era where we're going to see so much artificial intelligence and so much augmented reality uh, that literally, I think in the next year, we're going to see those things emerge as common technologies that common people in, in the world actually use those terms and understand what they mean. And sort of related to all of that, we have robots. We have jobs disappearing. We have entire industries in the next five years are going to disappear. You know, think about when all the, well, not all, let's say 90% of the cars have no drivers. When 90% of the trucks have no drivers, there will be a handful of people who will sit in cubicles and they will actually remotely control those trucks for the last 10 miles 
and probably the first 10 miles. So they'll, they'll get it out of the city and onto the freeway. And then the truck will drive itself for six or eight hours. And then somebody sitting in a cubicle will park that truck and get it through the city to its final destination. But there won't be truck stops because they won't need, people won't need to stop, get a shower, grab a meal, get some uh, gifts for the kids. So lots and lots and lots of jobs are gonna be affected by that one industry. And that's just one example. If you go to the website, willrobotstakemyjob.com, you can put in industries of your clients and find out what's the probability. And again, there's some speculation behind what these numbers mean and so forth, but you know, get a sense of what your clients look like today and which industries are not going to disappear. Obviously, you wanna build clientele who are going to continue to exist <laughs> in the next five years and not simply have clientele who uh, are not going to be around for a while. So uh, in terms of the production within my company, I, I'm hoping to get one absolutely totally new book out this year, not, uh, not a re-release -re or not a revision, uh, but a totally brand new book, so stay tuned for that. Uh, I do have the new SMB Roadshow and uh, information will be coming about, out about that. Again, look for my newsletter. We have 15 new, uh, 15 classes going on, two completely new, and then the managed services in a month, peer teams. So all of that is the new stuff that we are doing this year. Um, in terms of what you're doing this year, I encourage you to uh, try to disassociate yourself from all of the anger and frustration and stuff that's going on with politics and news and so forth. I think you should be aware and you should be educated and you should be involved in politics, but you need to limit that literally to, you know, maybe one hour a day and give yourself 23 hours to focus on your personal self and your personal growth and your family and your business and uh, happiness and, uh, you know, a, a more positive view of the world. <clears throat> now, let's talk about the theme of the day. So, um, what we want to do is talk about the growth of your company. And so many people in this business have been given very, very bad impressions. And in my opinion, incorrect, truly wrong information about you, how you grow a company. And so I want to give a slightly different perspective on that. I love this, uh, this quote, all your life people will tell you things and most of the time, probably 95% of the time, what they'll tell you will be wrong. <laughs> I think that's true with growth. I think that you have heard some really, really bad advice and you may have taken it to heart, you may have repeated it to other people. And a perfect example is, if you're not growing, you're shrinking. And that leads people to believe that you need to grow your business. I think what you need to do is you need to focus on consistency and reliability and scalability. The interesting thing about scalability is that if you build a scalable business, it will be well documented and it will allow you to grow and shrink as you need. But I don't think it's true that you are not successful unless you grow the number of employees you have, grow the number of clients you have, grow the amount of money you get each year. It is perfectly okay to stay where you are for a while and figure out how to make more money where you are. I would bet, let's see how many people are on the call now, a little over 100. I would bet that there's easily 50 people on this call who when, when they look at themselves, they think, man, I'd have made more money if I never tried to hire a, a third technician, if I never tried to hire a, a salesperson, right? So forth and so on. So that is true for a lot of people. A lot of people don't want to have employees. They don't want to uh, have the hassles of dealing with employees and banks and payroll and all of that kind of stuff. So, 
you have to figure out what's the right size for your business and how to get yourself there. We have an interesting history when it comes to small business. You know, every once in a while, there's this, uh, I don't know, it's not, it's not quite a fad, but you know, there's ebbs and flows of, of interest in small business. And the, the math makes perfect sense. If you think about it, companies like Microsoft look out there and they say, you know, in, around the year 2000, wow, there's like 25 million small businesses in the United States. There's probably closer to 100 million worldwide. We need to be able to design a product that we can sell to every single one of them. And so their vision is that there's millions of little dots out there. And how do they connect with the small business dots? Well, they train up IT consultants to sell and service their products. And they basically create a channel and say, there, that's my sales force. That's my service force, right? And so they sell to everybody. And the, the theory is that if you can get all of these little companies that are making uh, 5%, 10%, 20%, then you know, they will sell your product times millions. Well, that's great and that works for a while. But as I said, this is a thing that ebbs and flows. And so that only lasts for so long and then other things come along. So if you go to the Small Business Administration, they have all kinds of information, including their FAQ, which has, um, it's now pretty old and needs to be updated, but information about what small businesses looks like. And there's probably been growth since then. So there's a, at that point, five years ago, 28 million, probably closer to 30 million small businesses in the United States <clears throat> represent 50% of all private employment, but 22 million, that's one, that's three fourths of them are one person shops. They are non employers. So think about that, that so many millions of people are one person shops, they employ nobody other than themselves. And just over half of them work from home. So when people tell you that you gotta grow and you gotta double and you gotta double some more and you gotta double some more, that's not obviously the case for everybody. So when you think about it, it is okay to be that one person shop. And I wish I had the numbers on two person shops because I think that's a far more common thing. So what happens is that we make a bunch of money for these big companies. And I'm not trying to pick on Microsoft, but you know, it's true with Intel and HP and Dell and everybody else. They all wanna, they love small business. They wanna engage in us, but then a lot of them look and see, wait a minute, if I cut out the middleman, right? This is called disintermediation, right? You're the intermediary. So disintermediation means they're gonna cut out the person in the middle and now essentially, why would they care about small business? Because their numbers have grown too big. When you think about what's happened within our own industry, a lot of the vendors that you see at the shows, when they started out, they had 100 partners and then they had 500 partners and then they had 1,000 partners. And so then you look at how many endpoints they support. And uh, you know it starts out with 1,000 and then 10,000 and then 100,000. But when it gets to millions, when you're supporting tens of thousands of partners and millions of endpoints, especially if you have venture capital, then you start looking at kind of the big corporate view of the world, which is I need 10, 15, 20% growth per year. Well, if you are looking at millions of endpoints, coming to somebody like Carl and saying, okay, you support uh, 2000 endpoints, that's not big enough to make a blip on our radar we are not interested in the smallest partners. We need bigger partners. And so they take less interest in us and we have to figure out how to make money without 
them being engaged in that love affair. So what happens after that? Well, interestingly enough, eventually somebody does the math again and the entire cycle is going to start over. And when people look at it and they say, think of all the people who are installing the IOT devices and the security devices and the artificial intelligence devices into hundreds of millions of homes in countries all over the globe, we need to figure out how to get a piece of that action. How do we do that? Well, we have to befriend all of those little companies because if every company has a thousand homes and every home has a thousand light bulbs or whatever the IOT devices are, then pretty soon that adds up to real money. And so the cycle begins again, right? And it's, it's this constant up and down, up and down of um, taking one perspective of small business when you zoom out and look at all the millions of dots and then zoom into a, a different perspective and realize, oh man, all right, we can't sustain our growth. Luckily, in IT, there's always somebody inventing new things, coming up with new stuff. And so there's never a shortage of ways to make money and to engage people. One of the reasons people like me love the channel is I love companies who have dedicated themselves to only partnering with people who will become their sales force and their support system. And so when they say, I'm not going to compete with you, I'm not gonna sell directly, that's a huge, huge piece of the action, right? And it's impossible to have 100% channel focused vendors, but it's very possible to have 80 or 85, maybe even 90% of your vendors be 100% channel focused. So that's just, that's a bias of mine. And uh, I, I assure you that <laughs> That will affect my potential revenue from um, the uh, vendors who may or may not be watching this. So this book, I love this book. If you haven't read it or listened to the audio program, I highly encourage you to go get it. So the, the Millionaire Next Door is old. You know, the, the first chapter desperately needs to be updated with modern numbers, but the basic message is super, super cool. I always think about this book when I go to the cleaners. So I have my shirts laundered. And so every week I take my shirts in and not just the cleaner I go to now, but almost every cleaner I've ever gone to. The cleaner I go to now is run by a man and wife team. They have pictures of their dogs and their vacations up on the wall. They've never had an employee. They've been in business for 30 years. They've never opened another office. They've never expanded to a different state. They have never had six locations so that they can get more money and more money and more money. They work probably 10 hours a day, six days a week. Um, but they are literally the perfect example of the millionaire next door. They don't drive fancy cars. They buy a new car every 10 years, not every other year. They do take vacations, but they don't spend exorbitantly. They don't spend more than they have. And so the, the whole concept of the millionaire next door is that we are surrounded. If you walk up and down your street, you are surrounded by people who just go to work Focus on that work, do that thing for 10, 20, 30 years, and don't overspend. And they put a bunch of money in the bank and they have, they, they're happy to have the right size business. Now, that, I'm not saying that's the right thing for every single person on this call. My point is simply, that's a legitimate way of looking at your business and your life and you do not have to go into the growth spiral. So when you think about growth, stop thinking in terms of there's only one option, and that is I have to double the number of employees, double the number of clients, double the amount of revenue, right? What, where is the growth in your company? 
what's the right size for your company? I will say the happiest I have ever been in the business world was when I had a company with 12 employees. I directly managed the service manager, the office manager, and a programmer. The office manager directly um, managed the administrative assistants and accounting. The service manager obviously directly um, managed the technicians. And that was for me just the right size company. It was just perfect in terms of being able to do the jobs we wanted to do, take on the clients we wanted to take on. We didn't bid on super monster big jobs because it would mean that, that the, the tail would be wagging the dog, right? That that company would then completely dominate the way we have to grow our business. So we turned down some business because it was bigger than we wanted to be. If I had grown beyond that, I would have felt obligated to divide up the service department and now have maybe a morning manager and an evening manager, which I, I did in the last real job before I started my own company. I managed a much bigger team. And so uh, the, the, one of the departments had to be divided up uh, again. I think there's a natural limit to what one person can, how many people one person can manage. For me, that's five to seven. Like seven is really the outside limit of how many people I want to directly manage. So you have to think about what it means for your company. Like, do you want to be 12 people? Do you want to be six people? Do you want to be two people? Or do you just want to be one person? All of those are legitimate answers. Once you have figured out what size you want to be, you can then focus on how do I make more money at that size? How do I make more money within that? Uh, one obvious way is to um, go ahead and reduce costs. You know, one, one of the things that my office manager for eight years used to do, every single month, she would pick one thing and try to reduce the cost of that one thing. One time it was office supplies, the next time it was uh, insurance, and the next time it was mileage that we paid technicians, and you know, on and on and on. Uh, any, anything where you spend money is a legitimate place to look to see if you can save some pennies. You also have to understand that you're in an ever-changing environment. Not only could you not replicate the business I had when I had the perfect 12-person business, I couldn't replicate it either because I have different technicians, I would have different clients, I would have different products and services, right? You can't go back. You can never go back. You can never stop. That's true. You can only go forward. And you can either go forward with intention about how you want to build your business, or you can go forward simply responding to the environment around you and bouncing around like a ping pong ball. Obviously, my goal for you would be that you go forward with intention and figure out ways to increase profit. So one of the myths of growth is that you have to constantly be adding clients, adding revenue, adding locations, all that kind of stuff. Um, I just simply think that that's not true. And again, I would say half the people on this call, when they look around, they, they, they realize, man, I made as much money with one employee as I made when I was by myself, right? Because if you think about it, there's a simple math equation. If you hire a technician who gets 60 or $80,000 a year, you have to make 60 or 80,000 more in profit just to break even. So you will never grow your business more than the day that you hire one employee and double your business, right? From then on, you add another one, well, okay, now you've gone up um, from, from two to three, all right, that's a 50% increase and so forth and so on. It's very interesting. Literally two or three days ago, somebody sent me an email and I responded to him very, very honestly and, and in kind of some tough love. And then I didn't hear from him for a couple of days and I thought, oh my gosh, I may have lost a friend forever. But this morning he emailed me back and thanked me. But his question was, was literally on topic for this. The question was, you know, I'm, how do you recommend that I grow my business? It's, I'm a six-month-old managed service provider, 
and I'm trying to hire a business development manager, a salesperson. And I told him, I don't think you should do that at all. My advice, if you are just starting out in this business, is that you do all the sales and you do all the service and your first employee should be an administrative assistant who can do invoicing and billing and collections and uh, order processing and all kinds of paperwork that's not related to delivering technology. And I've given this advice for, I don't know, 15 years. I would give this advice more strongly today than ever because most of what we do in cloud services has nothing to do with technology. Setting up 50 new email accounts for a client is an administrative task. It is not technical and you should not be charging or you should not be paying somebody 60 or $70,000 a year to do that. You should be having an administrative assistant do that. And then I told them, I think your second employee should be a technician. So that way you can start, and if you can do it, a, a part-time technician, but certainly uh, start handing off some work to somebody, train them up on your processes and your procedures. Having a technician forces you to uh, document your processes and procedures because that's part of your branding. So if you want to grow, that's the way I would do it. Start with an administrative assistant, go to a technician, do the sales yourself. And to be honest, I personally don't think that you should hire a salesperson until you are right in the neighborhood of a million dollars in top line revenue. Because that's, that's the point at which you will have enough money flowing through the system to be able to siphon some off and pay somebody who is not bringing in revenue for quite a while. It takes a long time to get a salesperson up to speed. And if they want to make, say, $100,000 a year, they need to sell a million dollars in top line revenue in order to bring in $100,000 in commissions. So unless you're at the point where you can add a million dollars worth of services and deliver them without hiring another technician, you're in no position to go hire a salesperson. Much better to, uh, to go talk to um, Vertical Axion, you know, Herman Poole or uh, Robin Robbins and figure out how to create an inbound marketing system that works. And, you know, that's, that's the way that I recommended that he grow. Now, that, that advice isn't necessarily true for everybody, but I think it's true for a lot of people in this business. This idea that you have to hire a salesperson. You don't. It's your business. You can do whatever you want, but you need to do it with intention and you need to have a plan as you look forward to 2018. How will I grow my business? How will I grow my profit? Because at the end of the day, the amount of money that you get to keep is the single most important piece of it. And if you end up giving yourself a heart attack or um, literally just unbalancing your life and your kids don't know who you are, that's a big, big problem. And uh, I ha had a great conversation with a good friend of mine recently uh, who was talking about, he literally remembers the day he decided that he needed to spend more time with his family because of a very specific conversation he had with his little girl. And if you find yourself in that position, you have to remember that the goal of your business is to help you follow your dreams. The goal of a small business is to fulfill the dreams and wishes and desires of the owner, period. It is not to meet the sales goal of Ingram or Six or, or anybody else, right? Intel, Microsoft, don't let anybody else tell you what your goals should be. So <clears throat> some people will tell you, you have to have an unbalanced life. You have to. There are actually people I see, people put stuff on Facebook that says, you know, forget balance. Balance is bullshit, right? Well, I'm sorry. Balance is everything. And the people who uh, make that claim the loudest tend to be the people who've already unbalanced their life and figured out that they need to spend more time uh, being balanced, but they still put up that smoke screen that, that balances bullshit. I also think that it's a total myth that sales is the most important number. If you have somebody selling the wrong thing, not making profit, selling it to the wrong clients, and then you've got churn, you've created all kinds of disasters within your own company um, because you're not selling the right thing to the right people at the right price. 
when you are selling the right thing, when you've got it nailed down, you know, one of your, your, your great packages of managed services or cloud services, that is where you get on a roll and you just rinse and repeat for the next 10 or 15 years. So another um, myth is that you have to look big. The truth is that when you are doing business, what you find is that businesses like to do business with other companies that are about the same size as they are. So small businesses like to do business with other small businesses. So, Mr. Josh, are you on the line here? I happen to be, Carl. Okay. So I'm going to remember the screen, but I'm going to zoom back to, I heard that clicking and I was like, is there something wrong with my hard drive? That would be me and I'm sorry. <laughs> All righty. So for the folks who uh, were here earlier, uh, this is Josh Peterson on the line. And uh, Josh is the one who runs Bearing McKinley and will be managing the managed services in a month peer teams. So give us your 30 second spiel here. Oh, wow. Sure. Um, <laughs> <laughs> well, we, we're so excited, Carl. Uh, it's all we've been talking about over here at Barry McKinley for uh, about the last two weeks, just getting everything ready and to welcome all your uh, great participants and the folks that have been paying attention to managers in a month and all the things that you are working on. I loved coming in on that slide about sales myths. Those are awesome. Uh, we're ready to, to bring you guys all into our peer team environment. It's all about accountability and education, and it's all about really having a playbook uh, that Carl's provided over so many years with the managed services in a month. You're going to sit down and work with, with people that are playing from the same uh, you know, set of rules that you are. So we look forward to building this community of folks that have read managed services in a month and come in and, and can really participate at a level where they understand where they want to go and what's really possible for, for them. When you get in that peer team environment, you've got you know, nine other guys in your group or nine other guys and gals in your group who are trying to build a business that makes sense for them and that makes sense for their, for their financial health and well-being and just their own you know, personal lifestyle. So it's not a one size fits all. It's how are you doing it? Are you getting the results you want? And are you able to learn and, and help someone else next to you achieve the same for themselves? And just so folks know, I met Josh because he was the team leader for a peer group that I was in many years ago. And not only am I still in touch with Josh, <laughs> but mm -hmm. I'm in touch with several people from that peer group. So uh, it, it, it made a permanent positive impact on my business and on my life. I will tell you that. Yeah, for sure. You know, we, I've been facilitating peer groups and peer teams for about 12, 13 years now, Carl. And I can't tell you the number of times we've heard exactly what you just said, where you meet these people, you know, their businesses, you know, their financials, you know, their lives, and they become your resource network for, uh, for forever, really. Um, in fact, the, the group that you were involved in, Carl, that group, many of those same members are still together after all these years. They are actually still in, a, in the same exact team and group. Well, maybe we can all go back to New Orleans and have another. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> that sounds real good. So, all right. So uh, we have a webinar scheduled for next Wednesday. And if you go to smallbizthoughts.com or subscribe to my newsletter, um, you're going to see a note about that. I did put up a blog post about this today, both there and at SMB Community Podcast. So uh, stay tuned. And on the 17th at 11 a.m. Pacific, I believe, we have, uh, we're going to answer all your questions. So Josh will join me uh, with that and um, present a little bit about kind of the details of how the peer teams work and how they're constituted and literally answer every question you've got, whether it's about money or how often we meet or how involved Carl's going to be or whatever. So please join us then. All righty. Thank you, sir. I appreciate you joining us. Of course, Carl. You mind if I stick around and, and, and watch the rest of your, your presentation there? I don't mind at all. <laughs> all right. I look forward to it. Thanks, Carl. All right. Thank you. Okay. So back to where we were. <clears throat> so 
some of those myths. Now in terms of what do you want your business to look like, it took me a little bit to find somebody walking up the stairs here, but I think you need to look at the growth of your business in terms of stair steps, right? That you might stay at say two or three people uh, for years. And, and that might be uh, all you ever want to do. Um, and then at some point you get a new technology or you get a new product or service and then you say, oh, we need to go to the next level. Okay. And for you, the next level might be opening a second office. It, you know, it might be intentionally going to a different city. Uh, there's somebody who I happen to know on this call who literally for lifestyle purposes decided to move to another state and continued to run the, her old business in one state while she lived in another state and started another business. Not, not another business, but basically another branch office. So that is becoming more and more manageable in the 21st century. You also have the case that an employee doesn't have to sit across the, the table from you or across the room from you. So I have a handful of employees now. <laughs> it's so funny. Uh, just, just through a series of events within my business, I went from having one part-time employee to having four part-time employees and to having outsourced resources in other countries. And so this year looks very different than last year, but given where I am and what I want to do and who I want my uh, clients to be and who I want to, my, you know, what I want my workforce to look like, that's the right combination for me today, right? So again, if you're the owner, if you're the manager, think about what's the best fit for you. And for some of you, the answer is, I want to be a one-person shop. I want to be a two-person shop. I want to be a three-person shop. That is okay. So when you go to these conferences, and some of you have been going to conferences for 20 years and hearing people talk about grow, 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 you're, you've already learned how to think of it and filter it in terms of forget that, how much profit, and I'm going to spell much correctly from now on, but how much profit do I want? And you can make a lot of profit as a one person shop. I've had more than one person send me notes about being able to figure out how they can bring in between 250 and $300,000 as a sole proprietor, a sole sole proprietor, a non-employer. So, you know, it is possible. It is, it is quite, quite manageable. And again, in the 21st century, it becomes easier and easier. You also have to think about what's your exit strategy, right? Um, some people intentionally, what th their goal is literally start the business, grow the business, get it to a million dollars, sell it for a million dollars, and then go on and do the next thing. Well, again, you need to go to sellmymsp.com and talk to Rayanne and Amy and sort of begin the discussion about what your business is really worth. But other people say, hey, no, I don't want that at all. I want to fine tune my service offering, make it ridiculously profitable, and then just rinse and repeat for the next 10 years, bringing in enough money that I can siphon off, you know, 50 or $100,000 a year to put into savings. That's completely manageable in this business. If you are stuck not charging enough money or going on to Facebook to ask people, you know, how they pay their tax bill every year, you really need to figure out how to take your business to the next level. It will not, it will absolutely not happen by itself and it won't happen by you going to work every day and doing exactly what you did yesterday. You have to make changes and you have to be intentional about how you want to grow your business. Um, you also get to make all kinds of choices about what you want to sell and how you want to sell it and, and how you're going to grow. So again, you, you know, you have to learn to start thinking in terms of long term, what do I want? What's my exit strategy? How do I get there? Right? Uh, I've told the story before, but when my one of my brothers came to visit me one time, he looked up and I had, this is literally 15, 18 years ago, I had a, a big number written on the wall in my office. And it was, it was the number 1 million, 1000000. And he's, he asked me, what's that? And I said, that's the number. And he said, what's, what number is that? <laughs> and I said, well, that's the number that 
Uh, first, I want my net worth to get to that number. And then second, I want my available revenue, my, my available money to get to that number. Because net worth, you know, you live in California and pay your rent or pay your mortgage long enough, uh, you will be worth a million dollars, but that doesn't mean you can spend it. So it, it was literally, it, it was hard and it took me dozens of years to get a net worth of a million dollars. And it took me one year uh, for about half of that to go away. So, uh, and, and it's, it's been a rough climb to rebuild that. Uh, but they always say, you know, it's, it's easier the second time. Unfortunately, they also say you got to go through this about three times. So, you know, it's a never ending process to figure out what you want to do, but you have to start out with some number and your, your number might not be remotely close to that. It may be that, that your quote unquote number is that you want to have one nice home that you own in a nice place so that you can live there for the rest of your life and never have to worry about it. Right. It may be that what you want to do is, retire and run a charity in another country, right? Whatever your dream is, whatever your goal is, that's the legitimate goal for your business. Your business exists for it to help you reach that goal. And so you got to figure out what does that look like? And then it becomes clearer. Oh, to get that, let's say your number is 3 million, right? 3 million cash. All right, to get that, you have to have a certain kind of company that produces a certain kind of revenue that sheds off a certain amount of money every year that you don't spend on RVs and vacations, right? And, and once you put that system in place, you can reach it. But you have to have that goal. You literally have to write it down in order for it to happen. And you don't have to have all the details. You know, I'm a huge fan of, um, uh, you know, the, the one-page business plan, right? That, you know, it, it takes about one page of information and, and diagnostics for you to figure out what your business should look like. You don't need a 30 page business plan unless you're going to Bank of America to ask for money. So what does make your business successful is to focus on consistency and scalability. The interesting thing is scalability doesn't require that you grow. Scalability requires that you are capable of growing. And, and here's what I mean by that. If your business is scalable, it means you have standard operating procedures that you could get six people from your IT pro user group to help you do a big job, hand them the instructions and everything goes perfectly, right? And then you go back to being whatever you are now, one, two, three person shop. And so scalability is, is the process of creating something that can be reproduced again and again and again. It goes hand in hand with consistency. Scalability is simply the, the capability of reproducing your success again and again and again. And you know that, that whole concept of standardization is really about branding, right? Branding is not your logo, right? And, and again, a couple of years ago, I did this presentation where I had a, a picture of the Volkswagen uh, smog test you know, and it's just the entire screen is covered with smog and because of the issues that Volkswagen was having about cheating on smog tests, the results said, you know, that they passed the test, right? But Volkswagen's logo didn't change, but their branding was dramatically damaged by having their engineers cheat on designing a car that figured out when it was being tested for smog test and lying to the instruments. And so the engineers not just lied to the customers, they lied to the salespeople, they lied to their bosses, they lied to the management. Somebody somewhere approved having that system be put in place. So imagine if you spent, I don't even know what it is, millions of dollars buying a Volkswagen dealership and then this comes out and now you're going to spend years backpedaling and apologizing and promising people that that will never happen again and so forth. That's all branding, right? That my point is every single thing you do in your company is branding, not just your logo. So the way that you greet clients, 
the way that you manage your first job, the way that you onboard people, the way that you deal with problems, the way that you install patches, fixes, and updates, uh, the way that you bill, right? Every single one of those things builds your brand and nothing will make your company more valuable when it's time to have an exit strategy than to have a consistent set of processes and procedures so that people can look at it and they say, I like the way that that company does business, right? That's where you need to put your focus. And if that means that you need to grow to six people or 12 people or 100 people, then you should do that. But you shouldn't do it because somebody in another company said, oh no, we need 20% growth for you to continue to be our partner. One of the interesting things that somebody said to me recently is that the most important piece of their strategy for success is having the right partners, right? Not just vendors, but people that you do business with, people who are uh, suppliers, people who are technicians, people who are outsourced resources in other countries, right? All of those partners are what in the, in the project management business, you know, they, they talk about people who are invested in the project. And it doesn't mean that they're the boss, doesn't mean that they're the owner, right? But they have some, um, something at risk in that project, whether it's their job or whatever. Uh, and they call them stakeholders, right? So your stakeholders include your clients as well as your uh, employees and your vendor partners. So all of that is about how you build your company and how you do it with intention. <clears throat> um, I also think that you should focus on cash flow and profitability. And to be very honest, I've done coaching in this business for years and I have trained tens of thousands of technicians. People don't pay enough money, pay, pay enough attention to money in this business. I know a handful of people that I can look at and say, you know, I know for a fact that he knows what his bank balance is. But most people that I meet don't. I'm shocked at how many people are running $1 million businesses and they look at their finances every three or four months. It, it is literally the case if you just opened QuickBooks and looked around a little bit once a week, you would start making more money it, without specifically doing any one thing, but just paying attention to your cash flow. And by cash flow, I literally mean you should create an Excel spreadsheet that says, here's how much money I expect to get between now and the next paycheck, the next payroll, and between that payroll and the next payroll. And here's how much money I expect to spend on bills between now and the next payroll and the payroll after that, right? What is that cash flow? How much money do you have in the bank now? How much is gonna flow in? How much is gonna flow out? And then payroll. How much is gonna flow in? How much is gonna flow out? And then payroll, right? When you focus on that, it automatically gets better. And it's, it, again, it's not because you specifically make decisions, but it's in your brain and it's, it's there. And so many people in this business are kind, loving, wonderful, amazing people, and they focus entirely on giving spectacular service, which is cool, except when it makes you unprofitable. You also have to be a business person. You have to focus at the end of the day of how much money you're able to keep and put in the bank, uh, and that's gotta grow year after year after year. And if you have a negative cash flow and you are putting money on a credit card in order to uh, run your business, you need to take care of that immediately. And, and however you need to take care of that, you need to figure it out. And paying attention to your cash flow is the first step in that. So, um, as we begin the year, I ask you, what's your business model? What do you want to do? Uh, do you want to be involved with a partner who works through the channel? Do you want some to work with people that you are reselling something where they have a direct relationship with the client? Do you want to do break, fix, manage services? I think we all do some combination of all of these things. Um, I think you need to focus on the fact that we are deep into a period of disintermediation. And so, you know, it's, it's one thing to whine about, you know, Dell competes with me. Dell's always competed with you. But now, almost every vendor you have 
there's a site where clients can go and buy direct. So how do you sell against that? How do you partner with the right people on that? Because you are the intermediary between the product and the client. So a disintermediation just means that somebody's making money cutting you out of the picture. But you also live in an era where all of your opportunities are expanding at, at the speed of light. So, you know, choose a business model that works for you and make that happen. The good news is everything that you need to do is in the future. None of it's behind you. Whatever, however you got here is irrelevant. You have to create your future. You have to decide what you want your business to look like and you have to start moving in that direction one step at a time. So my goal, to be very honest, I literally have a written goal to help myself and help others to be more successful in their lives. So that's what I do. So that's, I hope that you will do me the honor of following my blog posts and subscribing to my newsletter and, um, you know, engage me in a discussion this year about the things that can make your business more successful. Thank you for tuning in. I will take a few questions if people want to put them into the, the question uh, box. Uh, William asks, will this be available for download? Yes. So assuming that the recording works, <laughs> uh, I will, uh, I will uh, have news in my newsletter and on my blog about uh, how you can get a hold of it. Um, Greg Gregory asks, do I have a class on how to grow revenue? I don't have a class on that specifically. That's an interesting question. Um, he says, I don't want a bunch of employees. Uh, less is more, but I do want to have more revenue. So um, four to five new managed service clients that would change my world, um, but I, I haven't found a way to get the right clients. So this, th this is literally, uh, I mean, I, I had a chat with somebody yesterday about how that is the never ending question uh, in managed services. How do I get more clients? How do I get the right ones? Um, so I don't have a specific class on this, but I would say that kind of big picture, um, most of our classes are kind of covering those topics, you know, covering how you uh, grow your revenue and so forth. Uh, we, we cover a lot of that with standard operating procedures. I have, you know, a set of about 25, you know, big picture guidelines for my life, uh, things for my business, things like always get paid in advance and so forth. Um, so, you know, I do bring up those things a lot in what we do. Um, also, some of the stuff that Rayanne teaches in the classes that te she teaches at Great Little Seminar specifically cover um, a lot of financial related stuff. I will say in terms of how many clients you need, uh, I have been sneered at publicly on stage for telling people I'm a big believer in slow growth. I had it set as the goal of my company to add one or two really good clients every quarter. So I only grew my business by four to six clients per year, but I did it for 20 years and I frequently got rid of the smallest clients and kept the biggest clients and stair step my way up from there. Um, and when the recession hit <laughs> and I started heading in the other direction for a few years, uh, we peaked out at $960,000. So I, I almost built a million dollar business by adding one new client every quarter. So it absolutely can be done. It's just a matter of, of uh, being okay with the slow growth and, and having that be your model. Sam says, uh, just mentioned sell directly versus partners. How can you avoid clients from buying directly? Well, the answer to that is um, that basically we partner, for example, here's a perfect example. I partner with Rackspace. You can go on, your clients can go on Rackspace and go buy hosted storage. Um, but I bundle it in with something else and I simply use Rackspace as a brand name of a publicly traded company that I think adds credibility to my offering. And um, I, don't, I don't sell it directly. So there's, there, I'm never actually selling that thing unbundled uh, to clients. And so uh, I just say, you know, we provide this, this, and this. Uh, you know, Viper is our antivirus. Rackspace is our hosted storage, right? I throw out those brand names 
because my clients know that I'm not building a data center and I didn't write, um, you know, an antivirus program. Um, so even though they could buy those things directly, I put together a bundle that I think provides unique value and I sell that as a bundle. Uh, yeah, and you're right. Everything's available online and it's, it's usually cheaper, cheaper online. Um, and yes, it's true for hardware as well. Hardware is an interesting thing. So I have always uh, been an HP partner. Uh, it starts out because I, I built and, and uh, installed compacts in the companies that I ran up through uh, 1993, 94. Um, but anyway, um, you can go online and you can go to HP and you can get pre-configured amazing things and go click, 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 and it shows up right at your doorstep. Generally speaking, you can buy a very similar machine from me for about 20% more. Um, I insist on marking everything up from whatever my wholesale is, I mark it up 25%. And the result is that it looks the same um, as what they can buy online. But I tell the clients, it's not the same. Like when you go online, you don't know what the level two cache of that machine is. When I buy it, I do know that I'm selling you a machine that doesn't have zero level two cache. And I've had a client have that exact same experience where they, they went direct and said, you were going to sell me the same thing. And I said, no, I will not. Right. I'm going to, I put a premium on my prices because I, I do the research to guarantee that you're getting the right thing. And uh, I've always been more expensive than what people can pay online. So I'm, I have no fear of that. And I, you know, if, the other thing is if people want to go direct for things like hardware, I tell them that's great. Uh, I will sit down and help you guarantee that you buy the right thing. And then I'm going to send you a bill for $165 for an hour's worth of labor. Uh, Jason says, it's difficult to sell whatever as a service to clients. Uh, many don't seem to get it. Any advice on how to get them to understand why it's important to just move to the uh, client who understands it or, or to just move to the client who understands? Well, it's a 50-50 it's a battle. So I personally want to engage completely in the whatever as a service. I want to sell my cloud bundle or, or whatever bundle I'm selling. And clients who don't get it or who say, you know, I don't pay monthly fees or whatever, I literally say, okay, that's fine. I will help you find somebody else. I, I will not be tempted down the road of clients who have to be talked into what's good for them, right? So I'm, go I'm going to sell what I sell. And uh, I taught a class a couple days ago. And one of the things I talked about uh, in the class is that you literally have to figure out how you want to do business and then go find people who want to do business your way. And I would say in 90% of the markets in America, and, I, and, and probably in England and Australia as well, um, there are enough people in your community that you will be able to find enough people who want to do things your way. Now, again, if you have, let's say that you have contracts and yet you were like, for me, I want a client who's going to figure out a way to give me at least a thousand dollars a month. That's big enough to be on my client list. So gradually, as you say, well, I'm only going to take on clients who are over that. Um, you begin to grow your business with the right size clients, the, the people with the right attitude, the people who are willing to take your advice, the people who have some money to spend. And also what happens with that is that gradually over time, you become a little more, I don't know, sold on the concept that what you're doing is the right thing because you get more and more clients who want to do that. For some people, for many people on this call, having 20 clients like that is all they need for their business, right? That's $20,000 a month. That's a quarter billion dollars a year. Um, add a little of this, a little of that, you're at 300000 with hardware and uh, miscellaneous projects. Um, and for, again, probably half the people on this call, that's all you need to do uh, to have a very comfortable business that's very sustainable for 20 or 30 years. Um, if you 
focus on bigger clients. And there are also people on this call that they don't even look at jobs that are under 100 desktops. That's cool. But that means you have to have the staff to support that. Again, you have to right size your company and then go find the right clients. Um, you know, and, and don't forget, we always talk in generalities here, but you could specialize in manufacturing. You could specialize in medical. You can specialize in legal. You can specialize in all kinds of things that then bring you more and more money. Uh, I, I held my last SMB Roadshow in Las Vegas at the offices of my friend Mark. <clears throat> Mark focuses on car dealerships and he has figured out ways to sell them pretty much anything that has a spark of electricity in it uh, or is used by something that has a spark of electricity in it. Uh, you know, he sells, he has a completely separate company that all it does is refill toner for uh, car dealerships, right? So, you know, there's so many ways to make money. You know, that's the beautiful thing about the 21st century. In technology, I, we literally work in an environment where there's a big, I, I, I envision it as a big river filled with money flowing by, and you just have to figure out, you know, how big of a bucket you need and how often you want to dip it in the river. And, you know, don't follow somebody else's dream. It needs to be your size company, your size bucket, the amount of money you need. Um, and, you know, as long as you don't think you're going to make one big sale and get rich overnight, as long as you are willing to say, I have to work for 10 or 20 years or 30 years, I have to work to make this money. As long as you accept that, you're going to do just fine. So, I think that's about it for the questions. And uh, we still have over 50 people on the line. I'm honored that you would spend your time with me. So, um, and we are way over an hour. So <laughs> I thank you all for your interest today. I promise if you get my newsletter, you will find out everything you need to know about classes, peer teams, roadshow, and uh, where to find the, the download for this recording. Thank you very much. I wish you all a spectacularly successful 2018. And I sincerely ask you to email me if you have any questions. It may take a while to get back to you, but I actually have a folder in my Outlook called um, uh, respond at some point. <laughs> so, so if you send me a question, if it's short, I'll probably answer it right away. If it's really long, I'll, I will respond at some point. With that, I wish you a spectacular 2018, and uh, I look forward to meeting each and every one of you on the Roadshow. Thank you, and goodbye.